All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Lana Kalinowski. I am the NSPN SciPol Scholars Program Coordinator, and I'm also an alumnus of the program. So I'm happy to answer questions about either side, both as a participant as well as the one that facilitates the program. Uh, so I have a couple slides here just to go over what the program's all about. Uh, so starting with what the program is, uh, really this program is designed to give people hands-on experience in science policy, whether that's in an academia-focused role, a nonprofit-focused role, publishing, government, you name it. Um, and this was originally established just because as especially graduate students, we often don't end up with the opportunity to engage in science policy until after our time in graduate school is up. So this program really allows for people to get their feet wet in this area and get a little bit of money for uh, participating in an internship before they even finish their degree. Um, so there's two parts to this program. The first part consists of a six week boot camp, and this is essentially just a skills development program in, pre in, pre in preparation for the residency. I have more slides on this. We'll go deeper in a bit. Uh, but the boot camp has two co cohorts per year. The first one happens in the spring, so they run for six weeks from April to May. And then the one that you are likely all interested in starts in the fall, and this runs between October and November. Once you finish your boot camp, you are then eligible to become a SciPol Scholars resident. And this is a part-time, remote, hands-on project with a host office of your choosing. And there's a ton of flexibility here. Most people begin the residencies in January and July, um, but depending on your research or whatever you're doing, you could easily start in say March if you absolutely had to. Uh, there is a one-year limit to cash in your residency after you complete the boot camp. So moving on to what the boot camp actually entails, like I said, it is six weeks and there are a handful of different components to it. Uh, the first part is a, an asynchronous video lecture that you would watch every week. And these come from science policy experts and they're about 45 minutes long. Um, there's also a handful of associated readings to help you prepare for the lecture. Uh, and then uh, for each week, there is a two hour live boot camp class. That first hour of the class consists of a discussion slash Q&A with an invited science policy expert. So you get the chance to network and meet with people who actually work in the field. And then the second hour of the boot camp is a hands-on skill building activity that often happens in breakout rooms. So you get to really get some practice with some important skills that are required uh, often of people who participate in a residency. Um, in addition to those weekly requirements, uh, you all will also have writing consultants that you can work with. And I'll go over the deliverables in just a minute. Um, and these are really to help you uh, flesh out some of the deliverables that are expected of you throughout the course. And they've consistently been a valuable resource to anyone who participates in the program. And then finally, from a week to week basis, I also offer office hours. So whenever you have questions about anything in the program or uh, elsewhere, really, I'm happy to sit down and chat with all program participants. So there's a handful of deliverables for this program. Um, I am working on shifting the curriculum a little bit. So this might change ever so slightly. But as of right now, it consists of a two page policy memo, which I'll talk about in quite a bit of depth later on in the presentation. Um, you'll also work on developing a policy-focused CV where you can highlight your policy experiences rather than just research as you're used to all the time as a graduate student. You will also record a 30-second elevator pitch video, and this will be helpful in preparing you for your interviews with potential host offices. And then we'll also help you prepare a two to three paragraph biographical sketch of your background experiences and goals, especially as they relate to science policy. So if you have noticed any of our marketing materials, you may have noticed that we have a theme of green technology. So I just wanted to take a moment to talk about what that means. Um, so really all of our boot camps, they are based on a pre-selected theme in science policy. And this just keeps it interesting. 
uh, gives us something to kind of focus on. And um, I would say that the boot camp isn't completely about the theme. We definitely uh, cover things more generally, but there are some bits and pieces of the theme sprinkled in there. For example, all of the policy memos that uh, scholars write must be related to the theme in some way. Uh, I've seen people get super creative with this to link it back to their expertise. But I mean, you could also take it as a challenge, right? Like if you're not an expert in green technology, uh, many people who work in policy also work in areas that they're not experts in. So you can take this as an opportunity to get exposure to things that maybe aren't usually your cup of tea. Um, in addition to the policy memo, the final bootcamp session of the six weeks will feature a guest lecture from an expert in the area. Uh, which is really exciting. You really get a deep dive into that area for that last week. And I have this point bolded, underlined, and italicized expertise or prior knowledge in the theme is not a requirement for selection. So like I said, if you are not an expert in green technology, do not let that deter you from uh, not apply from applying. Definitely, if you are interested in the program, regardless of theme, I highly recommend you apply. Um, if the theme still is something that maybe you're nervous about, we do have uh, some tentative upcoming themes coming up. Um, so like I said, fall 2022 is green technology, which is confirmed. Uh, the next cohort in spring 23 is tentatively, tentatively going to be on science and, and the digital world. And then fall 2023, so a year from now, will be a science and public health tentatively. Uh, so now we're going to go into the residency a little bit. Uh, so like I said, this can take place at any time within a year of completion of the boot camp. And this can be completely sailed by the selected scholar. They de develop their own positions in collaboration with their host mentors, and it can take place really anywhere uh, as long as it fits these three criteria. So one, you must be given a project that is science policy focused, at least generally. Uh, two, the project must be able to be done remotely, and I'll talk about that in a second. And three, the host office has a staff member that can serve as your mentor and can support you. The average workload of these is 20 hours per month for six months or about five hours per week. Um, I've seen people shift these a little bit. For instance, if someone wants to work 10 hours a week, then they can do 10 hours a week for three months comes with a $3,000 stipend. The first is paid once you begin your residency, and then the second half is paid after a midpoint check-in with me. And then once you complete your residency, you'll be expected to do a final project presentation to myself and any other NSPN staff members who are interested. Um, so this program was uh, established during the pandemic. So that's why there is such an emphasis on remote work and we do intend to keep it that way. But I will say that if you do live in an area of a host office that you're really interested in working with and uh, you wanna explore the possibility of perhaps going into the office to work with them, that's completely fine. Um, but I will say that like the stipend for instance, wouldn't change if you were working remotely versus in person. So those are just things to keep in mind. And really the possibilities for your residency are endless. Um, like I said, the scholar really sits down and can forge their own path for this. Um, some common or previous uh, places that we've had people match with in the past include the Union of Concerned Scientists, Annual Reviews, Research America, Washington State Academy of Sciences, Federation of American Scientists, the others on the screen. Um, so you can see where people have ended up but um, really anything that you're interested in, um, definitely we're open to it. And I will also mention that uh, sometimes opportunities just pop up. So if the thought of going out there and networking with these host offices feels daunting, don't worry about that. Uh, we, all, we all the time get people emailing us saying, hey, I'm interested in hosting a SciPol scholar, and then I pass it on to the scholars that are interested. And we also have some good relationships with some of these offices as well. So definitely don't worry about that side of things. So that's kind of the overview of how the program works. So now I'm gonna go a bit into the application itself. So 
Right now we're in round one for our fall applications. And this consists of two brief essays that are 250 words each, as well as an outline of, their, of your prior science policy experiences. So you'll see text boxes on there that are like list all the science policy training courses that you've did and et cetera. Um, so with us being in the fall 2022 season, the round one applications are due on August 5th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you are looking ahead to maybe doing a spring cohort instead, those usually open up in January and close in early February. Uh, once those application deadlines close, we then invite up to 15 uh, applicants to submit for round two. And this is essentially a crash course in writing a policy memo as quickly as you can. So you're given 10 days to write a policy memo on a prompt that it will be given to you when you are invited to submit. And this is always related to the theme. So they'll have a list of options to choose from. Um, and once you write this policy memo, if you are accepted into the program, this is the one that you will workshop throughout the course of the program. So don't worry, you won't be writing this piece of writing for no reason. Uh, you'll work on workshopping it with the writing consultants and uh, we can discuss ways on how you can uh, broaden the impact of that piece of writing even further. Also in round two, you'll be asked to write a 300 word goal statement, uh, which is pretty straightforward and applications are scored by a combination of science policy experts, program alumni, as well as NSPN staff and myself. This is a lot of text on the screen, uh, but this goes over sort of the intended participants for this program. So we're really aiming for early career scientists here. Generally, it's a whole bunch of graduate students, but we are open to any level from undergrad to postdoc. And we expect that you have a good base understanding of science policy, but do not yet have the experience or bandwidth to commit to a full-time job or a fellowship. This is not a beginner's course. So you are expected to have at least some understanding of what science policy is. Uh, so I will say that some prior exposure and experience is important here. And I'll go into some examples of what that can look like on the next slide. But this also is not intended for those that are so advanced in science policy that they could land their dream job tomorrow or six months from now. Um, so often we get people who are, say, two months out from finishing their PhD and then they do the program and instead of cashing in the residency, they go on to do a fellowship with like AAAS or something. So that's something we're trying to avoid here. Definitely uh, keep it in mind if um, you do have some time in your training to do a, a part-time uh, residency uh, right now, that's definitely ideal, as opposed to uh, us losing you in the pipeline from uh, being a graduate student or whatever to doing a full time job. But I will say also that, like, if you are advanced in your science policy career, that won't necessarily be exclusionary in your application, like you won't be rated poorly for something like that. I just want you to be aware of what the program goals are so you aren't disappointed if you end up with something that's maybe more basic than what you were expecting. Another thing we're looking for is just a, a wide range of experiences, interests, identities, etc. Because these are cohort based programs, you will be spending a lot of time in breakout rooms. And uh, I have noticed that many people in this program end up building a sense of community with others in their cohort and learn a lot from each other. Um, so things happen such as like, I don't know if I'm reviewing applications and I see that we're about to accept 10 neuroscientists, obviously I go in and make sure that not everyone has that same experience. We have a wider range of experiences in there. So that's just an example. Um, so here's a list of good ways to repair um, if you are interested in becoming competitive for this program. I will say that things like policy writing are number one. So anything you can do to either publish a piece of policy writing or participate in a policy writing training experience, whether it's offered by NSPN or elsewhere, uh, are really uh, top of the line here on experiences that you can have. Um, for having a base knowledge of science policy, we recommend taking an introductory science policy course or certificate these pop up from time to time from different organizations like AAAS's case or the Science and Technology Policy Academy, 
or even science policy courses offered by your university or others. Um, so if you are interested in taking an intro level, level science policy class, but don't really know what, where to look for that, feel free to send me an email and I can help you find good opportunities for that. And really just anything else related to science policy is always helpful. Uh, whether you've done a Hill Day you're, or you've met with legislators or staffers at any level, whether it's federal or state or even local, uh, leadership roles in any organization, but especially ones that are science policy and communication adjacent, uh, science outreach or communication, say you do outreach to uh, K through 12 kids for science, that's always great, grassroots advocacy, uh, working for a nonprofit or NGO, and of course, participation in, participation in NSPN is also a very helpful experience. So lots of good ways to prepare here. Uh, while there is that slightly elevated importance of having policy writing experience, I will say that these are all fine uh, ways to prepare for this program. And then just some final notes on applying. Uh, when in doubt, do apply. Uh, if you don't think that you are qualified enough, but still want to give it a shot, I highly recommend it. Uh, we do have a very holistic uh, application procedure here, so uh, definitely give it a shot if you're on the fence there. Um, writing is assessed at every stage of the process, not just the policy memo. So I will recommend definitely proofreading as I have bolded there, writing complete sentences. And then one thing I see sometimes is uh, people will write only 100 words instead of the whole 250. Uh, definitely, that won't work out in your favor if you do that. Definitely take advantage of the word limits when they're there. Like I mentioned, of the ways to gain experience in science policy, uh, number one is your policy writing experience. So can't recommend that enough. And like I said, the selection process is, is holistic. So just because someone has the most number of things on their CV, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're gonna be accepted. Uh, whilst prior experience does help to a degree, what you write in your essays holds more weight from a mathematical standpoint. It's worth twice as much in the rubric that, the, um, that your experience is. Um, if you are on this call and you are completely new to science policy, there is still plenty of time to become competitive for this program. Perhaps not for the fall one, just because those are due in a little less than a month. Uh, but if you start getting involved now, you can 100% be competitive enough for the spring 23 cohort. Um, and it, also, if you previously applied to this program and you were unsuccessful in applying before, definitely try again. It is a pretty competitive program. Uh, we do not have enough spaces to accommodate all the, of the, all the amazing people that come across our desks. So definitely don't take it personally. If you do get rejected on the first round, uh, definitely keep trying if this is something that you're really interested in. And just because I believe in full transparency, here is the application timeline. So like I've mentioned a couple of times, applications are open now and they will close on August 5th. Uh, after those go through review, the first round notifications will go out on August 22nd, and from the number of people that apply, 15 of those will be uh, invited to send an application in for the second round. So this is when you would get your writing prompts for the policy memo if you are invited to this round. Uh, then you'll have 10 days, so your second round applications will be due on September 1st if you are invited. Those will be reviewed and then final notifications will go out on September 12th. Um, so we aim for 10 to 15 acceptances. So you see 15 invites go out and there, there are up to 15 acceptances. So there could be a hundred percent acceptance rate here, um, but they, there might be some trimming based on the quality of the proposals that are submitted. So I will say that we do aim for a cohort size of 12. So we do try for some cutting, uh, but the possibility is up there, is there to accept everyone that is invited to the second round. Um, if you are not selected and you are in the second round, uh, we won't let your hard work on your policy memo go to waste. We will be providing you with feedback on that. So don't worry about that kind of stuff. And then the boot camp for the fall will run from the weeks of October 3rd through November 7th. And the exact day and time will be chosen based on a poll that we send out. 
uh, to those who are selected in the cohort. Generally, this happens on a weeknight for our East Coasters. It's a late one. Um, when I was in the program, myself as a participant, uh, we went from, it was eight to 10 on Tuesday nights. Um, so definitely be aware. I mean, hopefully it won't be that late for the next one, but uh, you never know. And of course, exact dates are subject to change. Uh, I will never leave anyone hanging. So definitely don't worry about say if I'm late a day or two and in, uh, inform you about something, uh, everyone will be informed about their status no matter what, whether it's an accept or not accept. And all deadlines that are listed here or ever for this program are always at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. I know a lot of programs don't always list the time, so I'd like to be transparent there. And with that, that was a lot of information. So I am happy to take the remaining time to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, feel free to type those into the chat um, and as well, my email address and our program website is listed on the slides and these, this presentation will be posted to our website uh, pretty shortly after this presentation. So I'll pause there and welcome any questions. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I guess my first question is, after people do their internship, do they tend to get um, job offers with that particular company? Does that happen pretty often? It has happened before. That actually happened to me. So it's definitely not unheard of. Um, probably not something to bank on, uh, but I, I always tell my scholars to be open about that when you're interviewing with, with potential host offices and saying, hey, like I'm interested in potential full-time position in the future, like tell me about the possibilities of that happening. Mm -hmm. It's a very valid thing to ask in potential interviews. Okay, cool. And then the second question I have is like, you said the host offices, where are, the, are they listed on the website somewhere? So these are completely flexible. So um, you can, like if you have a, an office in mind that you're interested in working with, uh, you're free to email them and say, this is the program that I'm, that I'm in. They'll cover the stipend um, and then like CC me on those emails if you're in the program. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good questions. Anything else from anyone? I'll give it a couple more long, awkward seconds, just in case anyone's typing. All right, well, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to me talk to you. Uh, I look forward to reading your applications when they come in. And as always, if you have any questions about the program, feel free to shoot me an email at any time. Take care, everyone.